Good evening. Before we start, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to USD 305 in our board meeting tonight. USD 305 does have a policy requiring masking in 305 buildings. Uh, you will notice we do have a new board member, Bonnie uh, Schamberger, and she would like to take a minute and speak to that and, and the fact that she is not masked tonight. Because my local, oh. I am not masked because my local doctor has given me an exemption from wearing a mask for medical reasons. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. I felt that it was important that because Bonnie and I visited and it is not that she is in defiance of school district policy. She supports that. Uh, it is for another reason. I would ask that uh, we rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. you so we will now move to the first item on our agenda which is the approval of the agenda we cannot hear you president i think you'd like to move your mic closer to your face if you're talking to us okay the first item on our agenda is approval of the agenda mr president i move we approve the agenda as presented we have a motion is there a second second okay we mo a motion and a second. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Okay. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7-0. The next item on our agenda is rep rep recognitions and presentations. And do you make a difference awards? Good evening. The You Make a Difference Award is presented to staff members whose exemplary actions support students, colleagues, and the mission of Salina Public Schools. Recipients of these awards receive a lapel pin and a handwritten note personally delivered by a Board of Education member. Jan Henry, Special Education Paraprofessional at Schilling Elementary School. Jan has been deeply involved with special education students at Schilling for the past 10 years. She is hardworking and does whatever is needed to ensure that students' needs come first. Jan is deeply involved in the parent-teacher organization and accepted the position of treasurer to support its continued success. Thank you, Jan, for making a difference. And now we will move on to Renaissance Teachers of the Month. If Superintendent Exline would please join me. And if all the Renaissance teachers with us this evening would please line up as well in the front, we invite you forward. Today we recognize Renaissance Teachers of the Month September through December 2021. Renaissance teachers are recognized through radio announcements and on the USD 305 website. And as I call your name, please step towards Superintendent X line and then return to your uh, place when you're finished. Central High School for September, Lizzie Eads, World History and Criminal Justice. For November, Zoe Patrick, Family and Consumer Science. At Lakewood Middle School for September, John McKinney, seventh grade social studies. For November, Renee Toms, sixth grade science. At South High School for October, Arnold Schmidtberger, English language arts. For December, Don Luthi, Special Education. And at South Middle School for September, Stephanie Metlin, Family and Consumer Science. For November, Mackenzie Weishar, Physical Education and Reading. And for December, Jamie Dome, Eighth Grade Math. 
Due to prior commitments, the following were unable to be with us today, Brad Dix and Barbara Hilt from Central High School, Trey Crow and Jeremy Stover at South High School, Jacqueline Higley Crow at South Middle School, and Kathleen Haynes and Trey Cullens from Lakewood Middle School. Please allow the Board of Education to congratulate you now. Thank you. It's always great when we can recognize our staff for the great work that they do. The next item on our agenda is approval of the consent agenda items, which include minutes of the December 13th, 2021 special meeting, minutes of the December 14th, 2021 regular meeting, the personnel report, the financial report, including the December bills list, the November treasurer's report, the November investment report, the November journal entries to improve encumbrance listings to train for the remote digital control system at the Salina West Education Center and the Operations Center in the amount of $24,535 to approve Heartland vehicle bids for two mid-size sport utility vehicles, less trade-in allowance from Don Hatton Chevrolet in the amount of $49,700 to approve the Schilling Elementary Roof Repair to Geisler Roofing in the amount of $58,993.44, to approve resolution, a resolution to establish election of school board officers, and to approve resolution to establish board's regular meeting dates. Is there a motion regarding the approval of the consent agenda items? Mr. President, I move we approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you, Dr. Bandry. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Grant, there's a second. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7-0. Okay. The next item on our agenda tonight is regarding public forum. We do have one person who's requested to speak during public forum. We do have a few requests. Um, on the action agenda items, I'm sorry, on discussion agenda items. Um, so, Ms. Carol Reed, if you could please, you requested to speak during the public forum. If you could come up. Ms. Reed, I know you're aware, but we do have the uh, participation statement that I need to read real quick just so that we can do that. I know you've already read the guidelines for citizens public participation. At this time we have public forum and I'd like to read the guidelines for the public. Public forum is a non-action item on our agenda. The board appreciates patrons taking time to share with us about their thoughts and concerns. Public forum is a time for comment on non-agenda items Comment on agenda items may be allowed later in the evening. This is not an appropriate time or place for patrons to make comments of a personal nature about any district employee or student. Persons making comments which violate the privacy rights of district employees and students will be asked to stop speaking or cease their remarks. If a patron or parent has a concern with one or more employees, the board will refer that person to the appropriate supervisor or to the superintendent for further review. Please understand that it is not the board's practice to respond to public forum comments or questions. Thank you. Ms. Reed? Sure. Um, I've been talking a little bit about this critical race theory every time I come up, and so I again want to uh, keep that before you so that you can keep it in the front of your mind so as you see things and uh, maybe can identify some of these things that would be our concerns, and um, this time, I wanted to read a quote um, from Senator Chris McDaniel from Mississippi, and this is his words. He says, anyone 
who claims critical race theory isn't being taught in public schools is either willfully ignorant or a liar. CRT is not a specific subject. Instead, it's a framework by which a subject, such as history, is taught. That framework is introduced through social emotional learning, which is exactly what is being advocated as curriculum shaping and teaching device in K through 12 schools in Mississippi. And it must be stopped. With very limited educational hours in the day, teachers should focus on fact-based methodologies, which enable all of our children to be successful, self-reliant citizens. They should not be forced by political busybodies to indoctrinate their students. Well, when I read that, I thought, that's exactly what I wanted to say. So I'm reading his statement, and I too want to say that what he sees happening in Mississippi is exactly happening in Salina, Kansas. I think our concerns over social, emotional, and these equity councils, we spend so much time. I have data that shows here from a special committee that was formed uh, by Linda Hyland. Uh, or with her as her testimony on here. So I can give a copy of this to anyone, but it talks about all the harmful discussions and testing that's going on in the schools and uh, a data collection system used in Kansas schools to, um, to test our children. And it looks like they are so inquisitive about so many things that they really don't have any business of. I think they're overstepping their boundaries and I think we need to be concerned. So I'd like to call it to the attention of the board to be very careful to overlook the testing that is given to our children that would undermine our parents and um, the teaching that I think that we need to have. So I can give you copies of this at any time. I did give Jim and Scott a copy so they can share their copies with you also. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reed. Thank you again for taking time to visit with our board. We always encourage and value the input from the community and USD 305 patrons. We appreciate you sharing your thoughts with us. The next item on our agenda is the action agenda. Sorry, I apologize, Mr. Farber. You, you had two requests on one page, and that threw me off. If you would go ahead and come up. Uh, thank you, uh, school board, for allowing me to speak uh, this evening. Uh, I'm going to speak for a few moments on an email that I sent to each of you a month ago, I think it was December 14th, if I am correct. And I received one response, and I appreciate that, Dr. Bandre, for, for responding. Uh, but I'm very concerned about the amount of funding that is going into our students and the results, education-wise, that that funding is bringing about. I went on your website, and, and, and again, this is not new information to you guys, but I want to bring this out to the community because um, it needs to be said, it needs to be brought up. Uh, per your website, total expenditures per pupil in Saline County, or I'm sorry, USD 305 is $23,176 per student. That is a large sum of money to be funded per student within our district. As I was uh, going around and speaking to the public over the last several months, and, and I, I got a lot of feedback, uh, many of the comments that I received were, I love living in Salina because we have this great school system. We have these great schools. We learn a lot in our schools, and I appreciated that. When I first moved here, I heard those same remarks, and I enjoyed that. I moved here from Mississippi. We were always the bottom four or five states in the union in education, and so coming to a, a better education opportunity, I appreciated that. What got me questioning these remarks is I did a little bit of research and I found out that Kansas is the 29th ranked state in the country education wise, which means we are in the bottom half of the country. Then I did a little more research. I, I actually went into some of the school rankings for our district, uh, our, our district. And, and, and again, I, I know I sent these to you guys, but I wanted to point it out. Out of 271 districts in the state of Kansas, 
USD 305 is ranked 208th out of 271 at a spending of over $23,000 per pupil. So I went a little bit deeper and I broke it down into our elementary schools. Out of 667 elementary schools in Kansas, Stewart Elementary is ranked 251. Meadowlark is ranked 258. Coronado is ranked 345. Huesner is ranked 381. Oakdale, 482. Schilling, 488. Cottonwood, 547. And Sunset is ranked 555th out of 667 elementary schools in our state. I went to our middle schools. Salina South Middle is ranked 235 out of 366. Lakewood is 298 out of 366. I said our high schools must be better. Salina South is ranked 215 out of 320. Salina Central is ranked 236 out of 320. My question is this. What are we receiving in response to the investment that we have placed to you? I can't blame this school board for, for all of those. I can't blame teachers for all of these results. I can't blame administration for all of those results. It's a combination of everything. And so we, we've heard over the last several months, we want to do everything we can to make sure that our students are learning. And we've heard over and over again, we want to do whatever is necessary to get our students in the school building which I think is a wonderful idea, except for the fact that when they are in the school buildings, we're failing them academically. It saddens me. It disheartens me. It's discouraging as a taxpaying citizen in Salina that we're putting all of these monies into our children, into our school systems, and our children are not reaping the benefits of that. I asked you, each of you, in that email, and Ms. Schamberger, I did not have your email. It was not on the website at that point. Now, perhaps these statistical ideas would be something good for you to hold on to and say, this is where I started and I want to go and I can move forward from there. But I asked each of you, Ms. Exline included and the rest of you, to give me a list of what you thought would help to publish a list for all of us as parents to, so that we could know what would help. And that's the exact response I got crickets. I, I don't know what the answer is. I, I hope that you guys have researched and tried to figure out what's going on. And I know I, I'm out of time, and, and I'll, I'll summarize with this. Something needs to be done. Something needs to be addressed within our school district that we can get a good return on the investment dollars that we are putting into our school district. And I hope and pray that this school board takes that seriously. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mr. Farber. The next thing on our agenda is the board representative, representative appointments. Superintendent, next slide. Because we have Bonnie joining the board, we need to have you go ahead and approve the committee appointments um, because she will be taking the place of Emma on the committees. And so we just need to take formal action on that. Do we have a motion? Mr. President, I move that we approve the 2021-2022 board representative appointments as presented. We have a motion. Is there a second? Mr. Grant? All in favor, please raise your right hand. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7-0. All right. We will now move to the discussion agenda and building the Building Bridges event with Dr. Curtis Stevenson. Um, here we go. Good evening. May it please the board tonight, I'd like to uh, update everybody regarding the Building Bridges event that we facilitated at um, Salina High School South. And um, a little uh, 
full disclosure, this is not a bridge in Sling County. So, uh, um, and this isn't the particular bridge that uh, is being built. We're talking more about networking tonight, but uh, it's a view, beautiful picture. So we'll we'll show it there. Um, the executive summary um, of this consists of basically the history of building bridges. It is an event that um, started out in western Kansas and it was piloted by various school districts. It is uh, also organized through Workforce One and, um, and working with the state of Kansas to help network uh, between our, our school districts and our business community in uh, making sure that we are responsive but also getting an opportunity to get input and feedback. And this particular event took place on November 11th, um, which was Veterans Day, and uh, from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. at South High. We have a little bit of information about how we celebrated the Veterans Day. Um, we had various keynote speakers at this event, uh, Mrs. Xline, Tucky Allen, as well as Eric Brown with the Chamber of Commerce, um, and um, also had an opportunity to um, really get collaboration going between uh, local businesses and our, and our educators and for them to have an opportunity to see what's going on in our public school systems, um, especially in the area of career and technical education. Uh, the why again for this is so that we are able to really calibrate, uh, to continue to refine um, in our schools what the needs of our business community consist of but also get an opportunity to bridge and network so that we're able to uh, capitalize on some of those resources in helping provide uh, work-based experiences. As I mentioned, this was on Veterans Day, which uh, shared as a great opportunity uh, for our local Girl Scouts Troop 20913 to present the colors, and they did an amazing job. Um, we also recognized um, those that served in our armed forces at this event. So this type of activity was important for us to provide an authentic um, learning opportunity for students within USD 305 in a public forum. We also want to give a special thank you to the Central High School and South High Culinary Program. Although this program was at South High, it did consist of students from both schools. And I cannot begin to tell you um, how, how fantastic the food was. I'm a, I'm a foodie by nature, and uh, they had some delightful treats for everybody. And uh, they were able to uh, serve those as a part of our professional culinary lab there in the uh, beginning of the ceremony during kind of the mixer where everybody was getting an opportunity to network. So they did a, a great job. Um, the pieces of the puzzle of who was all involved in this. So we had visitors from a variety of these career fields within uh, Sling County, and we primarily focused on career and technical education. Uh, we had 31 career and technical education students from both South and Central combined that presented or answered questions and asked questions of our business community members. Again, the Salina Chamber of Commerce helped us in our networking of over 100 businesses and industries that we uh, reached out to. Um, and if we had anybody that uh, maybe we didn't get an invitation to, we added them to our, our list. But we had a wonderful um, uh, networking opportunity with Salina Chamber of Commerce to send out those invites and, and a wonderful turnout. Uh, Kansas Workforce One, as I mentioned, um, really helps uh, as a part of this. Uh, when you think of Great Bend, Garden City, Kansas, Liberal, Scott City, um, Colby, different places where they facilitated these kind of um, opportunities for educators and uh, business community and students to work together. Eight career and technical education teachers um, from a variety of different fields, which I'll list here in just a second. Um, Ten guidance counselors and our support staff, uh, ranging from our custodians to um, uh, clerical that helped us kind of coordinate and uh, facilitate this event, making sure that we were uh, compliant, obviously, and everything was as safe as it can be uh, during this pandemic. Specifically, when we look at the community interest, five discussion groups emerge um, with business and marketing, construction, culinary, medical, and welding and manufacturing, approximately 50 different groups um, or in business entities or nonprofits uh, came a part of this. And as we looked at it, primarily manufacturing um, with, I believe, about 14 construction, um, 13. And then the breakdown kind of went down from there. Major employers, health, Salina Regional uh, was involved in this. Um, did a wonderful job bringing information in as everybody is looking for employees. Um, so this is a good opportunity for that to take place. So the three questions we asked of our, uh, our community members, our business members, was what skills do students need to be successful employees? How can USD 305 provide work-based learning experiences to students? And what can we do as a partnership to encourage 
graduates to stay and work in Salina or return to Salina and bring their skills with them? And uh, these were very important and powerful questions that we, we wanted to, to try to put together information. And we do have um, that, that feedback, but uh, for the sake of tonight's meeting and, and to keep this kind of condensed, I, I really want to put together kind of like a, show you a picture of some of the responses. And so basically the words that pop up here are major themes or salient themes. It's kind of a, a qualitative uh, a brief analysis looking at the salient themes that are presented in the feedback. And we'll do that with the first question here. Again, what skills do students need to be successful? And I want you to kind of step back and, you know, we can get into specifics on curriculum and look at technical uh, pieces of that. But really the major themes that came up here were, were, were driven from empathy, conflict management, time management, positive attitude, the ability to communicate, being driven, teamwork, working with one another, especially where there's conflict. And in time management, there's, there's those other things that are listed there. The second question, how can USD 305 provide work-based learning experiences to students? Getting our students outside of a classroom, but also giving them opportunity to have an insight of what exists in Salina, Kansas. From Western Kansas, I'm a, a Western Kansas import, okay? So I, I arrived in Salina and I was taken away by the awesome opportunities this community has. And I think that we forget that. I think sometimes we, we're not able to, to necessarily appreciate what exists in this community. And so when we asked our employers, what can we do to help our students understand that? It was beautiful, the things that, that they talked about. Job shadowing, um, getting internships in mental health areas, exploration of jobs, field trips, mock interviews, network, talking to students about salary, real world salary, like what you're going to make, what you can expect to make. These were the big themes that showed up, okay? And the third question, what can we do as a partnership to encourage graduates to stay um, and work in Salina or return to Salina and bring their skills? Because we know some students are going to leave. They're going to go out and see the world. Maybe they want to return to Salina. Maybe they don't. But how do we, how do we, uh, how do we improve that? And these were some very important real issues in our community. And I, I would love to say that it's just here in Salina, but it's not. It's, it, there, there's some significant challenges across uh, the state and, and the entire nation. Childcare, housing, family-oriented activities, affordable, more hands-on experiences, scholarships. When you look at the development that this community has going in downtown, when you look at the work um, with the trails, uh, with the fine arts and, and throughout the community, you start seeing some of these themes of what draws individuals to Salina. When recruiting for Salina and, and seeing individuals that come through our community and, and what we have to offer, uh, many of them, uh, they, they, they just step back and they say, wow, for a, a town that, that's this size, there are a lot of things to be offered. Now, there's always things that we can improve on, but I will tell you, um, the child care issue and housing, those are items that employers are starting to recognize and, and see. Um, and uh, that are impacting it. And so how can we bridge that? How can we work with it? So when you think about Salina Area Technical po College with the work they've done with the early childhood program and, and some of the efforts that are taking place with what we're doing with curriculum there, you can see that data really being applied here. But when you pull all three of these things together, it does make sense. The work that the board did with the visioning, you see these themes in that data. And so uh, again, there's a, a very specific uh, raw form of the data that's there. I, I pulled those together to kind of highlight the big pieces. Um, but the communication, critical thinking, social, emotional learning are very important and powerful. And uh, we're seeing that as we have more conflict and uh, the need to bridge that um, and to reconcile differences. Okay, so some powerful yet hidden forces in career selections that also impact beyond just what uh, we had for data. And I bring these up just to kind of keep these in the back of your mind. So a little vocabulary here uh, uh, coming at you with affluence, circumscription, and compromise. These are three very powerful forces that uh, can make a career plan change quite a bit, okay? Affluence, um, and I, I know there's a definition there. I like to keep things pretty simple. I call it a Coca-Cola taste with the Sam's Cola budget, okay? So having unrealistic maybe expectations about the amount of work or the skills or the wages and the affordability 
due to growing up with different uh, circumstances. Um, one of the things in the data that came out, students talking about, uh, or employers rather, talking about students having a very inflated view of what they will make in an entry-level job. And really recognizing this is, this is what you can expect at an entry-level job. Okay, these are what, uh, this is what consists of a salary. Um, you might not be looking, you might just wanna be looking at the dollar amount, but the fringe benefits and some of those other things that you really start on layering, insurance, et cetera. So affluence is a, is a force that, that is reconciled there that our, our youth does have. Um, in some cases, a little bit more of an inflated view of what, what they're going to earn or how much work it's going to take or how long they're going to have to go to school. And then this notion of circumscription is the powerful force of a family and what they see their parents do and how that can guide us in, in the different paths that we take. Whether it's we say, hey, I want to do what mom or dad did, or I want to make how much mom and dad uh, make, or I want to live in kind of a neighborhood mom and dad live in, or you know what, I want something different. These are powerful forces. Uh, the third thing, that, and I'll, I'll bring closure to this, is that compromise, and it's the process of adjusting career choices based on job availability. I have a family member who wanted to be a, micro, or a marine biologist, uh, but they married a farmer in western Kansas. <laughs> Limited opportunity there. Now, they, they did some work with the state and, and uh, in the wildlife and park area, but I, I kind of note this because they, they also have to match those skills with the realistic circumstances of where they're living and what they're doing. So those three items um, come together to really guide some of this and working with our local employers and our community, we're able to also see that in the data. Moving forward and where we go and what we gathered from the Building Bridges event, first thing is um, we have to learn what each has to offer and we have to continue to do that. We have to continue to explore that and educate and promote locally when we can. Our best export sometimes is our youth um, and we also know there's these students we call boomerang that, that they leave, they come back into our community. How do, we, how do we enhance that? And the third thing, and I don't wanna pontificate on this, but the individual plan of study. If there are parents in our audience or are listening tonight, you really must take the time to talk to your student on the individual plan of study and on the importance of the platform Zello that we are using to help understand and identify career interests and to maximize everything you possibly can to take the classes, to explore, to, to see what Salina, not only Salina, but Salina and beyond has to offer. So the individual plan of study and student-led conferences as we work forward at the high school level, um, looking to spring of 2023, and the expansion of work-based learning, internships, job shadowing, uh, these are extremely critical. And building all of these is what we're bridging to create community synergy. Our employers um, are counting on us and we're, we're working in line with them. I bring this slide up here so you can see um, at the closure of the Building Bridges event, they, they broke out into small groups. They had an opportunity to share student projects to talk about what they needed in the employment world, talk about what they could be expecting to make. There were some individuals there that were talking to future employers or future employees. Um, in this, at the end of it, they came back to the commons and we asked them, okay, there are some things with resource. And with resource, we're not just talking about money. We're also talking about skills. We're talking about opportunities to see the business. Um, supplies, yes, technical knowledge, curriculum. Um, these are the items that the business owners and the various individuals across the community of Salina came up with. 17 offered field trips with their facility. As you can imagine with COVID and and some of the liability, there are some things that are restricted, but we had 17 individuals offered to do that, 16 willing to serve as guest speakers, 14 to host a job shadowing experience. And um, to the business community, I would say that we are interested in expanding that. We are um, working very hard um, in the educational programs uh, department to expand as many opportunities for students to see different types of careers. We've had individuals reach out to us. Uh, one of them was uh, from the Gan Kansas Grain Inspector Service talking not just about college jobs, but jobs that also require individuals without a degree, the, the opportunities that exist. 13 willing to conduct mock interviews, 10 keynote speakers. We had nine volunteered uh, to serve on advisory councils, which help guide the secondary programs when it comes to curriculum refinement and updating. And then nine willing to host student internships, 
five that provide special training to teachers, and five, uh, and by that we call that externships. So if a teacher um, wishes to take a leave of absence or to work in a, um, in a different time, obviously, than from school, they have that opportunity to go and see what the business consists of and then return back to the classroom to teach our students. So this is an area that's always been there, but we want to grow that. Anyway, as you can see, a lot of different possibilities. We also had some offers for uh, supplies and technical equipment that can be used in our classrooms and our programs. So a uh, long way around it, um, we had a great turnout. Our students, our staff learned. We will be hosting this every single year. Next year, we'll be at Central High School, and we are expected to expand that program. And uh, to individuals that want to contribute to the educational process or to weigh in, I welcome you to attend Building Bridges so you can see the opportunities our students are given, but also the areas that we need to grow and improve in our curriculum. And so I thank all of the members who participated in this event, and uh, we look forward to making it even bigger um, and better next year. What questions can I ask or have the board ask that I can help answer? You alluded to it a bit there at the end, but I just wonder if word of mouth has started to spread in the community. Do you have any kind of early sense if more people would like to participate next year? Well, interestingly enough, as we were getting closer to the event, we received about uh, 15 more RSVPs that were not initially on our list for invitations. So we're seeing that grow prior to the event, after the event, and kind of where we're moving forward, uh, there has been some additional individuals who have reached out. We have also tried to identify barriers that maybe have kept individuals from getting access to, um, to work with our, our educators and you know just things with time and, and stuff like that. So we are trying to work through that. But we did have, um, I believe there were about five additional manufacturers uh, that weren't just in Sling County, but were in the adjacent areas that were also reaching out and talking to us. Nonprofit organizations interested in making sure that our students and community know what to um, exist. Uh, we do a cultural crawl with our curriculum where they can go and find out about different agencies and programs and stuff in Salina. When you think of like Parks and Rec and those, that programming they have, um, but th this was just some of the other nonprofits that are typically kind of not not always included. Um, so I think that word has grown. We did try to do a marketing um, campaign. I, I went on. Uh, I know we went to radio stations a couple of times. We ran signs on our LED. Um, we're hopeful that by um, adhering and showing them what we're doing with the information um, that they are willing to uh, come back and maybe even invite and get others more excited. So. Ms. Kessler. First of all, kudos. I think it sounds very well done, well organized, well thought out. I did not get to attend, but I will definitely be there next year. So thank you for doing this. I think it's needed. You brought up student-led conferences. My youngest would have been at the end of the individual plan of study. I think I've spoken with you about that. We, it was just now being talked about. So when you have a student conference now, is that independent plan of study, individual plan of study, brought to the conference and gone over with the parents? So to, to kind of, and, and there's, there's two uh, caveats I want to throw in there. One, um, the student-led conferences were piloted at South High um, the last the 2018-2019, um, um, when I served as principal there, COVID obviously stymied some of our progress there. Um, but uh, we, have, we have piloted it, and I will tell you, um, and, I, and I would equate it to building bridges, every time you have an event like that, you will get it a little bit better. Um, the first few conferences, I'll be very, very blunt. As a principal, I learned a lot. Um, of what I could do better to improve it. But we did look at the individual plan of study using our platform at the time called Career Cruising. And we just found out that um, I think the biggest takeaway was the amount of um, capacity we have with our teachers. We know we have capacity there. Uh, but often kids will talk to those teachers about their careers in more depth. Um, and with the four counselors that we have, with a caseload of about 250 students, they are working really hard to get them in and, and, uh, and help make those decisions. But in those conferences, we learned kind of what to do, what not to do. They did have that opportunity. Moving forward in 2023, um, it is a, a vision to um, have that in the spring when students are pre-enrolling so that there is a 30-minute conversation minimum with every parent that comes to conferences and a scheduled um, 
you know, methodical way where you're not in a crowded gym and people are coming and going in a fast fury. And they can have a very good conversation and look at Zello and the IPS. So if those parents have not um, had a chance to look at Zello. There are instructions on the high school enrollment guides at both Central and South High. Um, you can reach out to our office at uh, 309-4739 and call me. I will spend time with you and walk you through it. But those conferences are going to be incredibly important moving forward so that parents have that opportunity not only to know about what their um, possibilities for courses and, and, uh, and, and opportunities for students to explore, but also to learn about their, their student, um, their interests. There's interest surveys, there is information on costs. Uh, one of the links on that called Kansas Degree Stats talks about the amazing differences in costs uh, from one college to the next in planning. Um, so when, what we're hoping in the future as we move forward we'll have that. Um, we have not had that implemented to the full level that we, we want it to be. Um, part of that is the setbacks we had with uh, uh, some of the timing of launching it, but we are moving that direction and I look forward to this uh, district uh, being able to uh, uh, be recognized from the state of Kansas and the efforts that we're leading with the student-led conferences and IPS, individual plans of study. Sorry, we like acronyms. So. Thank you. Yeah. I might real quick, you, you brought up another term there and I made a note here I was going to ask, I don't want to jump in front of anybody else intentionally, but you, you talked about student-led conferences and I remember when we switched to that, that was a rocky road. Yeah. But uh, that, that's when you were principal at South High. Talk about that for a second. Yeah. Um, so, and I've got, I've got a daughter in uh, middle school and one in elementary. And when I go to conferences, what I will say is um, I, I usually hear, you know, what I need to. But I think what, what has happened in the past is we've kind of gotten the, the habit of we go to this conference, we have a five-minute conversation. There's four parents standing behind us. We go find the other teacher, and uh, we're probably only going to learn about uh, the things that maybe you know, are critical with regards to task completion, grades, maybe behavior. And you know, with all due respect, as a parent, I already know that. I can look at Skyward and see what my kids' grades are. Um, what got my attention was in 2006 when I looked at South High's data, uh, that was the year that grades went online. I was teaching then, and um, our conference percent percentage dropped. I think we got as low as almost 33% in parents, and that's not because parents don't care. That's just because they're saying to us with the data, what you're really here to communicate isn't that valuable. And so I want, I, you know, what we were trying to experiment, we picked the spring because that was the one that had the weakest uh, turnout. Um, I said, well, we're going to schedule these, and it was a it was a nightmare, okay? I'm going to tell you that. We had Google Forms and Eliminators, and I was trying to get it scheduled, and I didn't have the software, um, but we got it, and I said, we're going to start, and it's going to be messy, and we're going to keep working with it. We eventually found a software that helped make that easier. We launched it. It was not a success um, as much as I wanted. I think it caused a lot of, there were a lot of, there's some confusion. Parents say, well, I want to see all my, my kids' teachers, so we reformatted it to where they still had that opportunity. Um, but what I kept talking to parents about is a long conversation that looks at your students' interests, looks at your students' four-year course plan, talks about how much your student's going to spend if they're going to go into post-secondary training, uh, college, technical training, or right into work, what their options are. And so when we, when we got done with that conference, we retooled it, and it, it just, it, it kind of, uh, it's one of those unfinished things that I had at South High um, when COVID hit. And I hope that we can get both high schools moving in that direction. And so I, I, I just ask for people to be patient as they implement that. Um, and I, I like the expression, ready, fire, aim. Okay, we're going to go back and recalibrate. We're going to keep working on it. And the enemy of progress is the demand for perfection. It's not going to be perfect. But with the partnerships this board has approved, with the scholarships and the opportunities of this community, that's the last piece to connect it together in addition with building bridges. Anyone else? I had one other yeah. thing real quick, if I could, uh, Dr. Stevens. If you could scroll your slides back, the slide where you started talking about what the business owners said they wanted, if, if they were to hire a graduate from USD 305, what they wanted to see. Okay. What skills do students need to be successful yeah. employees? The, the thing that stuck out to me looking through this is when we went through our strategic planning process, these words were the same. I don't know that we've seen a change in three years in what our employers are looking for from a graduate from USD 305. So I appreciate the... Absolutely. 
I, I appreciate that. Okay. Any other questions? Dr. Bander? Okay. Okay, I thought you had a question. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Stevens. If I can figure out how to, what button to push here. That's what I pushed. <laughs> That's how my day's gone. <laughs> All right. So we will go to our, uh, our next item on the discussion agenda. With Tiffany Lowe. Welcome, Ms. Lowe. Hello. It's nice to see you. It is wonderful to see all of you. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do Mrs. X Line's PowerPoint, though. Which one? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm perfectly fine in my wheelhouse. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, wonderful to see you all tonight. Um, I just wanted to give you a really quick update on our mental health intervention team program. Um, so that is what I'm going to do this evening. Um, one of the things I wanted to touch on just on this overview is if you look in our KSD MHIT, which I'm going to throw out some acronyms just like Dr. Stevens did, in the guidance document, you, I think it's good to touch on the values and goals of this actual program, um, which are stated above there that they provide greater access to behavioral health services for school age students, and then they also establish connections between the local school district and mental health providers, and that's truly the backbone to our program here in Salina. Um, another critical, critical piece, and this is how I get to be involved, is the team members that are involved. Um, throughout the presentation, I'm going to talk about school liaisons, but I'll also interchangeably call them behavioral health liaisons because KSD calls them school liaisons, but we kind of call them behavioral health liaisons. So if I interchange those, they're the same people. Um, they're the same group of people. But what they do and the critical role that they play for us is they help educate our family about options if we have a family that comes to us and has concerns about their student's mental health or mental well-being. We, we can provide them with a referral process to Central Kansas Mental Health, or we also have um, additional options we can provide them with. Um, but they, it also, if we find that we need to have a conversation with family that we're seeing that maybe this child is struggling and maybe they need additional support, um, they're part of that process and that conversation. And then the other members, uh, the other tier to this definitely is the mental health providers that we work with that actually provide the services and use our sites to provide those services. Um, and just the implementation of the MHIT program um, in itself, the board actually approved that we started this in 1920, um, in the school year 1920. And really what that looked like is we presented this program to the staff and then we trained our school liaisons. Um, we're using our uh, social workers as our school liaisons, and each one of our buildings has a behavioral liaison. Um, that's what they spend time doing. Um, and then moving forward from 19 to the, the current present, it truly has been, has been a fusion of school and communi community support together. Um, and what does that look like then? Um, there's this communication with Central Kansas Middle Health Center and USD 305, and then there's also this communication with the, our community mental health center, but then also our school district and other local agencies. Um, if a student is receiving additional support from other agencies, of course, with, peach, with uh, parent permission, excuse me, not teacher permission, with uh, parent permission, um, this allows us to be able to support the student in the best way they can by wrapping up some services around them and talking to additional agencies that might work with them. For example, um, sometimes this works hand in hand with Big Brothers Big Sisters if a student is working with them, with um, CAPS. Those are some of the top agencies that I'll work with within this program itself. Um, and then communication with the community about the program. I have the honor tonight to be able to communicate what this program looks like in our school. And it's important that the community knows that this is a program within our schools and within our county. Um, the biggest communication piece definitely put is on the shoulders of our behavioral liaisons when they see a need arise. And that's more of an individual conversation with families um, in, that, on that, in that aspect. In my personal opinion, um, the best part that I get to talk about is how we provide services to students at school, and that's what we have done from the beginning, and it has continued to grow, and I think is um, made a good impact within our school system and our kids. Um, 
providing services at school and kind of what it allows. I'm gonna slow down a little bit because I go a little fast sometimes. Um, those on-site services really allow students to miss less school. And I'm gonna talk to what those services look like. But what I mean by that is if we have a therapist on site, let's say at South High School, they're gonna miss, let's say 30 minutes two times a week. Well, they're truly only missing an hour of school then to get those services. Instead of having to go pick the child up, taking the child to the mental health center, which also in turn helps our parents to miss less work. Um, and it reduces a barrier that could be there for a family. Um, and, and I think that that's a, a great piece to providing those services on, on site. Individual student services that can be provided on site are case management, um, social emotional groups, and therapy. And then additional services are wraparound services, telemed appointments, and teletherapy. And that wraparound service is kind of what I touched on previously. It truly is exactly what it's called. It wraps services around a student. Um, but if a student qualifies for those services, we actually generally use a school site, but every once in a while you'll, you'll use the mental health center. But it includes the school, the mental health center, the family, and then anyone that the family wants to um, invite to talk through what the kid's struggling with, goals for them later, and then everyone is a part of the, that, dis, that discussion so they can support the student in the best way that, they, that we can collectively. So the partnership then is through the MHIT um, program and the grant is strict is with Central Kansas Mental Health. And really what that um, does for us is it helps students have access to individual services that I touched on. It also helps if they qualify for them to have access to the crisis team if they need to and the Martin Youth Center, which I would highly encourage um, going there and visiting. Uh, Deanna is the director there and she is more than willing to show you her program and, and has really done a nice job over there. Um, I wanted to, as we talk through partnerships, also talk a little bit about the role of private practitioners in this um, because our behavior liaisons have a list that they continually update of private practitioners. And what that looks like is they, if we're having a conversation with a family or a family seeks us out to talk about my child is struggling, I, would, I need some services, or you know, you're, we're seeing this behavior, would you like to talk about possible services for a child? We do provide options for families so that they don't feel pegged into one option as Central Kansas Mental Health because that's really where the, the um, program is, the partnership is, is with our local mental health center. And then in our buildings, not every building, it kind of depends on the building and the demographic of the building, but in our buildings we have made arrangements where we do have some therapists that are private practitioners that we've had spaces where they can actually do their therapy within there, of course with family permission. And then we also have situations where um, some of our elementary kiddos with family permission, the practitioner will come and take the student from class, um, take them with them to their facility and then bring them back. And the last thing that I really want to talk about, which kind of is this theme throughout, is the collaborative piece between the local mental health center and USD 305 to best support the student that um, is in need of services. Um, one of the, and it's important to point out the measurements and outcomes that is required through um, KSDE to, that we evaluate that this program is even working. Um, and that is, we specifically look at four indicators that are not set by USD 305, they are set by KSDE. And it is improved internalized behaviors, improved externalized behaviors, improved attendance, and improved academics. Um, and I kind of described the difference between internalized and externalized behaviors, but I think that the collaborative piece that I want to point out the most is at the mid-year report, we, we look at this is a student that we're working on attendance. Has attendance improved or not? But the beautiful part is we're actually having conversations with the family, the therapist, the case manager, and the school so that we can, again, best support the student as a collaborative effort. Um, if a case manager is making goals with a student to improve their internalized behaviors, then there's conversations with the school. How do we support that with him to make sure that him or her is successful in our buildings as well? And does that even impact it them while they're in our buildings? And so that piece of, there was always conversations, but there's a lot more dialogue now, which I, again, think that supports our students best. The last thing that I wanted to point out is just a little data to give you some kind of frame of reference about what referrals look like and what does that mean. And actually the other day when I was sharing some data with Mrs. Excellent, I gave her a little bit of misinformation that I'm gonna correct now. 
So at the end, the, our very first year that we um, received, we were started this program, we had, because we had referrals before, we had students that um, engaged in mental health services, but there wasn't necessarily as much collaborative effort. Um, and there was 390 students that we reported um, engaged in services at the mental health center, but were also a piece of that was on site in one of our campuses in some capacity. So just because you qualify for some services doesn't mean you qualify for all the services, but they were using our school in some collaborative effort to get those services on one of our campuses as well. At the mid-year report, um, and so the fall of last year, there were 386. And when you first, that we reported on, when you first look at that number, in fact, the first time I was walking through this, I thought, well, but why did we decrease? That's actually not a bad thing. Um, as I was talking through some of these cases, someone can successfully be done with mental health services. So it does, it, because there's a reduction, doesn't necessarily that mean that we're not meeting everybody's needs anymore. It could mean that someone was successful. Um, so that mid-year um, report shows a reduction, could be closed successfully, or we could have students that move in and out, they could have chose different pr practitioners, that sort of thing. End of the year last year is a very profound number, I think. Um, by the end of the year last year, we had 476 students that were served at the mental health center, but then we were helping with a collaborative effort with the family in the mental health center here um, on site. The mid re report this year then, we're already at 360, uh, sorry, 463. Um, so I, looking kind of at where we are and kind of the referrals and even the interest that we've already had families have that maybe aren't quite ready to go through on the process with a behavioral liaison, but they're, they're talking about what are my options. We predict that that's gonna, I mean, it'll increase and we'll probably surpass where we were last year. Um, and then the last thing I want to point out just that's the most relative to just this time in this fall is that um, we had 102 referrals this year, new referrals. So in just in the spring semester from August to December, we had 102 new referrals and 91 of those referrals um, have started services. And I will say one of the things our behavior one of our behavior liaisons stated to me that she said, I really think you need to point out is that Sometimes referrals between that we were doing were, were slowed down, but we've really tried to go back and evaluate, okay, is the process working? How quickly are we getting kids services? Are they getting the appropriate services? And we're able to have those conversations. Obviously, the school system doesn't dictate those conversations, the mental health center does, but the dialogue that's happening is helping students to get services quicker. Um, and it, it was a huge positive for them who are doing all the work too that they wanted to make sure that I brought to your attention. There were 11 students that decided, or families, um, that decided that they didn't want services. And I also think that's important to, to point out too because sometimes they decide this isn't the route that we wanna go, and that's okay. <laughs> um, sometimes it's because they decide this just really isn't for me, or sometimes they go and do something different um, with a private practitioner, and again, that's okay as well. Um, they're just not with the mental health center anymore. I was not quite as long as Dr. Stevens. So what kind of questions do you have for me? I feel bad because I'm making a list. <laughs> well, come on. Um, first <laughs> off, I guess one thing, it, I, I think you said it, that these are voluntary services, not mandatory, right? Oh, 100%, so. yes. Thank you for bringing that act, act up, actually, because there's this conception that we are providing the services we don't provide those services, and its parents are part of the referral process, and they're consenting to all the services. And truly, once we help with the referral process, if, this, if the family wants us to help, because they could also say, you know what, Tiffany Lowe, I don't want your help. I'm just going to go do that myself, and that is totally fine, too. Um, we do not, none of our staff provide the services. That is strictly the mental health center staff. Gotcha. One of the questions I had was, what's the timeline? So if someone's if a student's identified where they could benefit from services, what's the timeline to get access to those services through this program? Yes, now I'm gonna be able to talk to a portion of that because it's a collaborative effort. <laughs> One of the things that we found last year was that there was um, the mental health center, one of our, our school liaison described it as cold calls. So we would, a family would be interested and we would say, hey, we should do this, this referral, this family's interested. Well, then the, the, the center would call the family and say, hey, are you interested? Well, sometimes the behavior liaisons have such good relationships and are able to have those conversations. The family doesn't know you. And I, I mean, if I don't know a number, I don't necessarily answer it. And so then 
it was taking a while and then we were having to follow up. So one of the things we adjusted last year is our behavior liaisons actually are part of, they help the family do the referral if the family wants to. So then it is a quicker into, they don't have to, act, they can actually do the intake with the family and them together with the mental health center <coughs> over the phone, down to even the insurances and everything because our behavior liaisons and social workers are awesome um, and they can do those things. After that, then, um, it, it's kind of at the mental health center how quickly things are processed. Um, and so I don't really want to speak to timelines that I'm going to give in, inaccurately. I do know it has been improved since we've been having these conversations, though, because we qu catch them quicker. Because sometimes families don't feel confident enough to call and be like, hey, it's been two weeks and I haven't heard anything. But they do feel confident calling the school and saying, hey, Tiffany, as the behavioral li health liaison, could you call? And we can kind of speed things along. Well, that's great because I know I'm, I, I have a lot of folks who try to get those appointments and sometimes they're three and four months out. Yes. So that's, that's huge. And I um, can say with confidence we have not had any that are three and four months out this year. We, those huge. referrals that have happened, we are starting um, that process. Now the services that they might be getting might vary and so the timeline varies, but we are trying to reduce that. And I know the mental health center, that's a goal for them too, is to reduce that time so that services are put in place. Gotcha. The other question I had, I feel sorry I'm taking all the time. Um, it's, it's not just something for parents that have barriers oh, no. to receive care, but what are some of those barriers that might not give a student access to counseling and things like that that they're overcoming through this program? Um, I would say insurance is difficult. Um, I wouldn't necessarily be able to walk through the process of insurance with our families like our behavior liaisons can do and like the mental health center can do. Um, and sometimes, depending on the type of insurance, private insurance, Medicaid, I mean just a variety of insurances, um, it can be very difficult. And I think a positive that I've definitely seen more this year too is that that can be a barrier in a variety of families' homes. Um, and so depending on what your insurance looks like, and I think that being able to have that dialogue and look through that, uh, Derek Knopp is our contact that's a school person at the Central Kansas Mental Health, and he's very versed in, in those pieces, and um, I, they, are, they do not allow that be, to be a barrier for a child to not get services. So I, I think that that's a huge positive. In fact, I can say that with confidence because we just talked about it the other day. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Lowe. Yes. Thank you. See this pipe's on. Yeah, it's going to, it's doing something else. <laughs> it's doing something else. We did have one patron who asked to speak regarding the mental health grant, um, Mr. Rodney Penn. And real quick, Mr. Penn, we do have a statement to read when we're talking about um, things on the discussion agenda or other agendas. Um, so as a, let's see, patron has asked to speak on the agenda item for our policy whether to allow to com comment or not is at the discretion of the BOE president. I'll uh, allow you five minutes to speak tonight. Um, once your presentation is, com uh, let's see. At this time, the board will hear public comment from Mr. Rodney Penn. Uh, please understand that it's not the board's practice to respond to public comments or questions, and you have five minutes to present to us, Mr. Sure. Penn. First, let me say, um, this is going to be hard. Um, I'm happy to support this program. Um, I'm an expert in the experience called complex PTSD. It has been my personal battlefield for 30 years. I am keenly aware of what it is like to feel trapped in a place that is unsafe or at least perceived to be. 
I know what it feels like when my body won't stop alarming my emotions and my emotions won't stop screaming, run! Get out of here. You're not safe. Again and again and again and again. I was preconditioned to psychological trauma by a very topsy-turvy childhood. And some studies even suggest that it can start in utero if the mother is under a great deal of stress. Why am I telling you this? I see this happening in kids just like me right now. The unintended consequences of a one-size-fits-all approach is likely to be felt for a lifetime in many of these kids in our community right now. I was predisposed um, to the likelihood of experiencing psychological trauma as a child. I had a triggering event in 1991 as a young Marine for which I did not get help for until 2005. Some of the kids in our schools grow up in amazing, stable, beautiful, wonderful households where they feel safe, affirmed, and loved. It is the place where they can escape the world and the pressure it puts on them. But for many, that is not the case. They live in unstable homes with conflict, and a small percentage are subject to unspeakable horrors. When they think of home... Their body's stress response is activated. The body is telling their emotions to fire up and get ready. You might have to run, hide, or fight. Again and again and again. What this is doing is conditioning them to believe things about their value and worth. For many of these kids, school was a pleasant escape. Then COVID. Now they weren't safe anywhere. A year later, here we are. Everywhere else this child goes is now deemed safe. Psychologically speaking, anyway. They go to the YMCA after school program where there's no masks. School, on the other hand, that's, that's different. For these kids, their body is telling them, run, you're not safe. They look across the desk and they see all the other students with the masks on, and their body is saying, you're not safe. The emotions are building up and they have nowhere to go for hours. They're trapped. So to find some relief from that, they act out. They scream, they lash out at teachers who are also stressed to the limits by all of this. Teachers just want to teach. They don't want to try and remember how close Johnny sat to Jill at lunch. They throw chairs at teachers. True story, I heard that from a a teacher. They might even break soap dispensers off walls in the bathrooms or sneak in with another student to do adult things. Now our bathrooms are locked at the high schools. But I'm here to tell you, after battling PTSD for 30 years, this is just the tip of the iceberg for some of our kids. Right now, day after day, these kids come to school and don't even know why they are so jumpy and irritable. Years down the road, though, like me, something will happen to them, maybe even sooner. Their emotional brain will get out of control because it's primed and ready for it i got a few more sentences. Can I finish? If that would be okay? If it's okay with the board. If if you wouldn't mind, if you could maybe submit submit it to the clerk in writing. Sure. And we could read it that way. Thank you. One size fits all doesn't work. That's why I'm not wearing a mask. Because I know what it's like to sit on a country road with a gun on my lap thinking this is it.
Thank you, Mr. Payne. The next item on our agenda is the return to instruction plan. The superintendent, next line. Okay, during our last meeting, you asked that I come back tonight and present to you some updated data on our return to instruction plan, so I have that for you this evening. I just want to start with, again, our goals haven't changed. We want to keep kids and staff healthy and in school, and we want to ensure that students have access to well-rounded educational opportunities. I want to review just real quick that safe return to instruction plan. This is required as part of the, um, the state requirements for us. And we have to speak in our safe return to instruction plan to the areas that are outlined by the CDC. We do not have to do anything in particular in any of these areas. We just have to have a plan that says, here's what we are going to do. So the areas are listed up there on the screen. We went over those last time. We do have to speak to what we are going to do as far as masks. We have to speak in that plan to what we are going to do as far as modifying facilities for physical distancing, hand washing and respiratory etiquette, the cleaning and maintaining of our facilities, and um, that does include ventilation. Any diagnostic screening and testing, the plan has to include that and then any efforts for vaccinations, and then finally, how we're going to coordinate with local health officials and state health officials. So like I said, we, the CDC has outlined these seven areas. ESSER requires us to say what we're going to do in each area, but it does not require us to do any certain thing. What, what we do is up to the board, okay? In addition, in that plan, we have to speak to how we are going to provide services for children's academic needs, social, emotional, and mental health needs. You heard some of that just now. And um, student health and food services so that we have healthy children to learn. So with that, the um, state, KDHE and KSDE, is telling us administratively that there are really three things that we need to be looking at. We need to be looking at, um, to keep schools open, vaccination is one thing, um, testing is the second, and then third is masking. So with that, I wanna turn to Saline County data because I think the local context is important. This is the same information I shared with you at the last meeting, um, but just with the columns from October removed, and then um, December added, and you can see that number per 100,000, this is just cases in Saline County. 150 is considered red, and you can see um, where we are on that. And then the percent positive, you can see what the trend is on the percent positive. Um, a 15% is considered, or above, is considered red. 10 to 15 is considered orange. So we have a little bit of both in there. And then finally, the CDC is releasing transmission levels for the different communities. And you can see that Saline County, we remain in the high, um, in that high transmission level. And that's the same as it was during, when I showed you this data last time. As far as COVID-19 cases in our K-12 buildings, I went ahead and updated this through the 7th. And so at the elementary level, we have um, have had 106 children at the secondary, 174 um, students for a total of 280. Staff members, elementary 22, secondary 14, and for a total of 36. So total COVID cases that we've had um, reported to us is 316. I do want to note that um, in a conversation today with County Health, they have 71 additional cases that are on hold because of changes in guidelines, and I'll speak to those in a minute. So 
that number is higher than that, but um, that's what I actually have, that we've worked to this point. And when I say worked, that just means it's been reported to us and, and I know of that particular case from County Health. So cases by week of exposure, this is K-12 only, meaning it does, these data, this data does not include Heartland and it does not include the um, district office. Okay, so K-12 buildings only. So if the case would have had, if it was a preschool case that occurred at Oakdale, it would be included in this data because that is a K-12 building, okay? So just for clarity there. So you can see how many positive, the positive cases by week there, and you can see the quarantines by week. Um, keep in mind that we had a couple weeks in there that were partial weeks because of Thanksgiving um, recess and winter recess. Um, but those are, those are the numbers that we um, have been dealing with through the week of December 19th. And um, at the right then, I did include the close contacts but not quarantined. Those would be students that the county health had determined did count as a close contact, but they did not quarantine them because um, both the student and the um, person that was a positive were masked. Okay, so test to stay, learn, play, participate. Um, we just wanna give you updated numbers here. In October, it, we had 116 students who were eligible for that program and 51 students took advantage of that program, so 44%. In November, we had 234 eligible, 86 took advantage for 37%. And then in December, 299 eligible, and um, 125 actually took advantage of that, so for 42%. So I wish those numbers were higher because that is one way that students can get back into school, but we are offering this to families and some families are taking advantage of it. And I, so I do think that it's important for us to continue um, doing that as long as we do have county health um, issuing quarantines for, as a way for us to get children back into school. I was asked about area schools and a case comparison. And so what I did was I pulled Southeast, that Southeast is Southeast of Saline, Twin Valley, El Saline, Salina, and Solomon. And this is data for last, it was the um, most recent reporting period. I actually pulled these numbers yesterday. And so you can see um, Southeast had 1.56 cases per 100,000, Twin Valley 1.87, El Saline 4.37, Salina 7.78 and Solomon 8.45. That data is presumed cases based upon um, where students are living. So, um, and this was taken straight from the KDHE website. I didn't do any massaging at all of this data. I pulled it just straight off of the website. It, what you can see there is um, Southeast Twin Valley, El Saline and Solomon are not masking. Salina is masking. Um, I, Southeast and El Saline have gone in and out of masks a little bit based upon just kind of what's happening there in their buildings, but just that, I just wanted to share that comparative data with you. Those buildings are much, much smaller than we are. Um, Solomon, I think, has 355 students was the number that they had on the state website. Um, so just that a real difference in student population. So I went ahead and I pulled similar size districts. And so these would be districts that are what I would consider comparable within about 1,000, 1,500 enrollment. Um, Salina was showing at about a 7,000 enrollment there, so I went down to 6,000 and I went up to 8,000 on this. And so you can see, um, and I put on there where the masking's optional because I thought that might help you. Um, Dodge City is the low, um, and again, the numbers do fluctuate quite a bit week to week, but three, they were the low at 3.95. In these larger schools, you don't see the same level of fluctuation that you do in the tiny schools because one case really pops the numbers up there. But in these larger schools, um, you see a little bit more stability. But Dodge City at a 3.95 per 100,000, um, Garden 4.79, and then you can see Manhattan, I'm gonna read the numbers because they are very small. 6.04, Goddard is 7.2, Salina is 7.78, Geary's 9.73, 
DeSoto is 10.84, and then again, masking optional at Derby, 11.71, and Mays, 12.45. Now, I want you to know I pulled the masking, um, whether or not they were requiring masking from their return to instruction plans. And I know that we, there have been quite a few boards that have met in December and even yesterday and are making adjustments to that. So when I, when I pulled this data from their websites, that was the most accurate data that I had as far as whether masks were required or not. So I, this has been in the news, <laughs> and I just I want to be very transparent about what I'm being told by Saleem County Health. Um, they did make a press release today that said that they would be getting more information from KDHE tomorrow. Um, as you know, the CDC recently released new guidelines for quarantines, and I know that this board really weighed the quarantines and the impact of quarantine on students being in and out of school and that intermittent schooling and the impact on academics and mental health, social emotional health. So the CDC did release new guidelines about quarantine. Keep in mind that in Saline County, the oversight agency for the health department is KDHE. So the Kansas Department of Health and Environment has to interpret those guidelines, and then they set guidelines that actually are what the, our county health department has to follow. Okay, so our county health department um, will look at what KDHE releases. KDHE um, has released guidelines for the general population, but they have not released the guidelines yet for schools. And we were hoping that that was going to happen yesterday. It did not. So that is supposed to happen tomorrow. Those guidelines then uh, will be released for schools, and then it is highly likely that Saline County will follow KDHE's guidelines, whatever it is that KDHE um, puts out. That's what they've done in the past. And so I do have a meeting with County Health on Thursday morning. Um, I wish I could give you more definite information about how quarantines are going to be handled, um, but we'll have to wait until KDHE gets their guidelines out, um, keeping in mind that they do treat schools differently than the population at large. So with that, I am open to questions. Um, and if there is other information that you need that I can collect for you, I am certainly happy to do that. I could go back to the slide about um, the uh, testing that regard. Thank you. Have you been able to garner, I guess this could be more gossipy than anything else, and that wouldn't do us much good, but why aren't people taking advantage of it? Is there a two or three reasons, or are they all across the board, or any sense on that? I, I don't have the answer to that. What I can tell you is we see peaks and valleys in taking advantage of testing. Um, we saw a peak, a high number of students took advantage right at Halloween time. Um, a high number of students took advantage per, right prior to Thanksgiving. A high number of students took advantage right at finals time. Um, so, you know, you see kind of this ebb and flow. Um, I, I can't answer. We haven't asked directly, why are you not taking advantage? Um, we ha we, what we do do is when we get a notice from county health that your child is expected to quarantine, then at that point we will send an email saying, hey, here's an opportunity for you. If you want to take advantage of testing so that your student can attend, continue to attend school, here's how you do it. So anytime we're notified from county health of a quarantine that's been issued, the parent does get an email from us with directions and a text message to let them know. Um, so I, as far as why people aren't taking advantage of it, I don't know. Now, you, you were saying that the CDC had sp specific uh, instructions for schools? The CDC releases guidelines that are for just 
re the regular setting, like for mm -hmm. any place where you and I would just go normally. And then they also release guidelines that are specific to schools. And my understanding is that the reason that they do that is in a school setting, you are with the same people for a, an extended period of time in closer quarters. And so, you know, when you go to the grocery store, you're not standing by someone for several hours, um, I hope. At least I try to get in and out of there faster than that. Um, but so there are different quarantine guys, I mean, not quarantine, excuse me, I misspoke. Different guidelines from the CDC for the school, K-12 school setting. Mm -hmm. And so what's happening right now is KDHE is getting ready to release what, how they have interpreted those guidelines um, for Kansas. Okay, and then Does the that... schools and the other schools, like you know, the graphs there, they interpreted them a little differently than uh, so oh. our, our district because of the board? Right, decisions? good question. Okay. Good question. What happens is then each, each county then decides how they're going to apply those. And so the, um, in Saline County, our county health department, has they've taken those guidelines and they've applied them. Historically, that's what's happened. Um, and I can't speak for them, but uh, when, uh, when I said on that last slide, that's what I anticipate happening, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that would be what I would anticipate. As far as these other districts, w each board has what is called home rule and can make the policies and rules to govern their district. And so in um, some of these districts, they have decided that they are going to make masking optional, and in others they've decided that they are going to mask when um, positive cases or, and quarantines maybe get to a certain threshold, and in others they've decided that they're going to universally mask. So that is a, it, that's a board decision on whether you want to require the masking. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Okay. Thank you. I've been doing my research. So, um, okay. the asymptomatic um, masking and the CDC was saying that. See if I have this straight. Five. They've gone down to five days. Right. Uh, quarantine at home and then five days with a mask at work or at school or whatever. Right. Is that correct? right? Okay. That's then, my understanding. Okay. Then I kept reading on down, and they said, well, it's not really convenient that you could just wear your mask for 10 days wherever you're at. Is that... Um, that, I think, is the kind of clarification that you're going to see come out tomorrow from KDHE, and then our county health officer will have to decide what to do with that. Okay. So, but yes, that there were there were some pretty significant changes in what um, the CDC was recommending as mm -hmm. far as quarantine goes. So, um, and that has hap that has happened once before because remember when we started it was at 14 days, um, and so I you know they're I think as they learn more they're trying to narrow things down. Well, it's but good news anyway. Yeah. yeah. Other questions. Doesn't look like it. Thank you, Superintendent. Excellent. Okay, thank you. We do have three uh, patrons who have asked to comment on this discussion item. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to ask that we limit those comments to three minutes each. Um, if we could, uh, Mr. Farber, I've got yours on top here, so I didn't, uh, didn't mistake it this time. Um, and, and real quick, if I could, um, at this time, we'll hear public comment from Mr. Farber. Please understand it's not the board's practice to respond to public comments during this time. You do have three minutes to address the board. Thank you, guys. Um, and, and I'm going to take a, a few seconds of my three minutes to say these three discussion items that we've heard about tonight have been very informative 
and I would encourage parents to attend this meeting, uh, whether online or in person. Uh, man, it, there's a lot of information that was given to us and to the board, and I appreciate uh, those who, who presented just a moment ago. Um, Ms. Exline, I appreciate all of the uh, work that you put into your presentation. It would be interesting to see um, perhaps some numbers from Ellsworth County. Um, as most of you know, Ellsworth County, uh, just before Christmas, put out a statement and the Ellsworth County Health Department says, we have met with the providers with Ellsworth County Medical Center, Dr. Whitmer, which is their health officer, and the Board of Health, and it was decided that quarantines have not been helpful for quite some time. After meeting with health, <coughs> excuse me, Ellsworth County Commissioners on Monday, 1220, it was decided that Ellsworth County will not be placing individuals that have been identified as a close contact in quarantine. Um, what we're finding out more and more is that the quarantines are not suiting the purpose that they were originally designed to accomplish. And I think Ms. Exline alluded to that a moment ago where we went from 14 days to 10 days and now CDC is saying five days. We're learning more and more about this and the quarantine is not the important part of that and I think that's a huge factor within our schools. Uh, we're wanting the children to be in the schools. We're not wanting them to be at home and, and separated from uh, social <laughs> activities, from, from teaching activities and so forth. Um, Quite frankly, the voters in this district, uh, by a two-thirds majority, voted on an ordinance uh, just a few months ago, and by a two-thirds majority, they emphatically stated that they were not in favor of the mandates of universal masking by the city commission, and that carries over into our school board as well. Even the CDC, if you've been following along today with their um, testifying on Capitol Hill and before Congress and so forth, the own, their own representatives from the CDC are now saying cloth face masks have little to no effect on the prevention of the transmission of this virus. They are now going to be coming out with new guidance saying all face masks need to be KN95 if they are going to be effective against this Omicron virus. That was one of the points that was uh, on, on the screen just a moment ago. If two-thirds of the parents within this district believe or simply think that they should not be uh, having their children subjected to universal masking, forcing them to be masking, I believe that it would be fitting to say that the parents within this district would say the same thing for our school district. The problem that we're having with the universal masking at schools, uh, one thing was brought up by Mr. Penn just a moment ago, it's affecting them psychologically, but they're leaving the school grounds and they're going outside and they're not masking after school care, tournaments, et cetera. And, and I think we're, we're missing the ball on this. I, I do appreciate that we're waiting on more guidance uh, from the health department. And thank I you, think Mr. that meant I was out of time. So uh, thank you guys. And, and I would ask that you reconsider this idea. Thank you, Mr. Farber. Dalton McDowell. Mr. McDowell, you'll have three minutes to present to the board. Thank you. There, there's only one way out of this pandemic, your body's immune system. There is no drug that will kill the virus. There is no magic formula that will kill the virus. The only, only you can do that, your immune, immune system, the only way for that to happen is exposure. You have to be exposed to it for your immune system to do its job. There's no other way around that. There are only two ways to be exposed, naturally or artificially. Artificially exposure is typically a medical concoction that contains small amounts of either dead or inactive virons a vaccine it does not guarantee immunity your body does that the reason why artificial exposure is effective is because the dead or inactive virons cannot replicate therefore your body's immune system is able to defeat the invaders quickly and produce memory to do the same with future exposures and you are then significantly decreased chance of severe disease based on future exposures. The risk-benefit analysis is a person's choice. 
there's kiss, cases of the mRNA therapy. Your body is tricked into producing proteins similar to the ones that the novel corona, coronavirus knows as SARS-CoV-2 that is not quite the same traditional vaccine, but you are free to decide if it is right for your child. That option is to take the, that option to take the experimental vaccine, their immunotherapy, where no one is liable for damage except you for assuming the risk has been available for long enough. Everyone's made their choice on that, so why mask then? If someone has made that choice to take the higher risk of contracting the disease, it is now on them. Your choice is to only protect you, no one else. You are the actual at great ri greater risk of asymptomatic spread than, unvac than an unvaccinated person because you're more likely to be asymptomatic. Life is, serious, is a series of assumed risks. Why do you feel necessary to assume someone else's risks? Drop the mask mandates. Raise your hand if you feel the same way. Thank you, Mr. McDowell. Kevin Beagley. Hey, Kevin. Hi. Uh, you asked to uh, address the board regarding this discussion uh, agenda item. You will have three minutes to address this. Thank you, uh, President. And the board and Ms. X line, I appreciate being able to be heard. Um, mask, we know work point blank hands down it's been proven i don't know where some speakers tonight got their information but i doubt that people speaking about mrna know exactly what they are unless they are a trained nurse or a biologist that said i'm going to tell you a story december 3rd my birthday I learned my cousin was admitted to a hospital in Texas with COVID. She was unvaccinated and refused to wear masks. December 15th, she was placed on a vent. Now, for those of you who don't know what a vent is, it's a ventilator. It takes over breathing. It's a tube about this long inserted into the throat through the mouth 90% of the time. Sometimes, like in the case of Christopher Reeve, he had a hole poked right here into his trachea, and that gave him the ability to breathe. December 31st, Anna Leva was removed from the ventilator and consequently died because of COVID. Her children now have no mother. Her grandchildren will not know their grandparents. The people that exposed her were her kids from school because they did not require masks. Another friend of mine, Monica, she died January 8th of this year because she too was refusing to wear masks. Friday, I get to go speak at her funeral. It's not something I look forward to. Monica was a beautiful soul and had a smile and a laugh for everybody, as well as a wonderful hug. Two fifths, cities are reporting increased COVID-19 cases all over the United States. USD 259 in Wichita canceled their Board of Education meeting because board members refused to wear masks. I urge all board members of USD 305 to vote to extend the mask mandate. And for the students as well as people in the meetings. 
thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you all again for taking time to visit with our board. We always encourage and value the input from the community and USD 305 patrons, and we appreciate you sharing your thoughts with us. That ends the discussion on our discussion agenda this evening. We'll now move into the next item. Oh. I'll give you three minutes, Ms. Reed, and then we do need to move on with our agenda, okay? Uh, I'm sorry for the loss of your loved one. That gentleman was just up here. We've all, uh, I don't think any of us, even of those that uh, don't wear masks, aren't empathetic and sorrowful for those that we have lost. We've all lost loved ones. Um, I, I think Tiffany made a really good point with her statistics on the mental illness and uh, the increase of how much there is struggling with the students in school. I think the increase in this half year was quite a jump and I think it was like 103. I'm not a numbers person, so anyway, it was a very significant number that, um, that the mental illness problem or mental problems had increased. And I just wonder if that isn't mask related. I know it's very important. I love to see all your smiles. I can't see them. I can see a little anger if somebody was mad, they kind of lower their eyebrows, but uh, it's very important to our babies and they need that. Um, I think with the social distancing and hand washing, uh, I, I too believe the masks are major problems with our children mentally. Um, also, um, I'm kind of wondering if this Title I program that we get ESSER funds, which it says it's Salina when you look on your website, that we get like 13, over $13 million for ESSER, which is a Title I program. And I have not a clue where that goes. I don't know if you guys have an itemized sheet, but uh, I'm wondering if a lot of these restrictions are caused by um, a fear of not getting money. And so it makes me wonder if this is about the money. I hope it's not. I hope that you all evaluate whether it's a problem with getting the funds that you want for our community because we get an awful lot more money than the ones, if you look at the list, we're one of the highest in Salina. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reed. We'll now move to the next item on our agenda this evening, which is school board reports and upcoming dates of importance. We'll begin with Dr. Bandre. So since the last meeting there, my main activities were the thank you sessions that Ms. Costa organized at a number of the schools. I was able to participate in those at Schilling and Sunset. And again, through the course of the pandemic, we've not been able to go into schools very often, so it was a neat opportunity to be in. I really enjoyed both of those places. Per the motion earlier, I continue representing the board on the Salina Education Foundation and the Smoky Hill Education Services Center. Neither of those have met since our last meeting, so nothing further update on those. Thank you, Dr. Bandre. Mr. Gardner? I met with Heartland. Uh, their board meetings, they're going well. Like I said they got new board members and uh, the transition has gone very smoothly, but they're still needing some assistance as far as teachers. So. Ms. Zimmerman. Since the last meeting, I was happy to get to attend the Central High Music Concert just before Christmas with the band and the orchestra and several choirs. And today I uh, uh, presented a program at Meadowlark with Songs of the Revolutionary War, so it was fun to be in the schools. That's all. Ms. Kelso? Um, there's a few updates from Michael Chambers from um, Salina Education Foundation. The lift deadline is January 30th. Teacher scholarship application deadline, April 1st. Senior scholarship application deadline, March 1st. And um, things are going well, though. We'll, we'll meet soon, and I'll have more updates on all that information. I did attend a Zoom delicate meeting, and through the thank you notes, I got to go to quite a few elementary schools, which was so cool. 
got to take my daughter, got to take, it was just really cool to be back in the buildings and see the kiddos. And today I went to Transitions. I think we're gonna be getting an invitation to dinner sometime. Um, she would like to have her students cook and serve. And so I said, maybe in March we could all go do that. So Stephanie Shell's doing a fantastic job there. It was great to go into that building and I've got um, opportunity now tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Grant. Um, two things since our last board meeting. Most of my uh, commitments haven't met. I did attend a Parks and Rec Advisory Board meeting. Uh, I don't think any information to present from that. And in December, I was able to attend Joyce Noel at Salina Central. Again, over a th around a third of the um, high school students participate in that event with between orchestra band and vocal music. And um, a great way to officially get into the Christmas spirit and season. Ms. Schamberg. Meeting. I attended an orientation meeting with, met all these wonderful people. They are amazing. Um, they're passionate about their job. They, um, our, our school district, since I'm new, I'm learning a lot. And it's a really good foundation. The, and it's a unified school district. And I'm thinking right now, our, the unified is kind of like, are we unified? Which, you know, I, I want to thank all you parents for coming because that means you care. We may not agree with to agree, to disagree, but you care about your kids. You care about the uh, the situation they're in. You're passionate about the mental health problem, and and Lynn is is just amazing. She gives me hugs, which is important, and encourages me beyond measure. Um, but she, I sent her a, a, some information because I like doing research, you know. And, um, and this is what she sent back. Hopefully I can read this. Uh, she said, thanks for sending the information. It helps for all of you as a board member to read information from multiple sources when preparing to make decisions that will impact over 9,000 people. This is certainly a multifaceted issue that has been very divisive. Now... I know there is division here, and I think a lot of it's fear, uh, fear of the unknown, fear of losing our freedoms, fear of, like, if they're mandating the mask, are they going to mandate the vaccines? We don't know where everything's going. We read about Oregon. Uh, the, you know, it's, there's fear going on here. But I did do some research on the children's psychologist. There's lots of articles around with that. The effects of masks and lockdowns, uh, creating a generation of children who exhibit lower IQ and signs of social brain damage. Uh, with the pandemic restrictions, the fear we instill in children has led to a worsening of psychological problems as well as discipline problems and drops in academic levels. Um, to solve the problems, um, we need to de-escalate de the fear and the anxiety around the COVID of our children, especially the, the kindergarten and first grade that never they don't know school without a mask. Um, so it's kind of like, yeah, you know, this age is the least likely to be infected with life-threatening complications. Yet at this age group, this is the, ma the affected by the mandate. So the state has no mandates for the public, you know, unless that changes. County has no mask mandates, but our school is mandating the mask for our children in the area. And then there was an, a video that was sent out to all the board members with the doctors all around. And that was, you know, they did, their two solutions was kind of like vaccine and, and um, masking. Oh, we didn't talk, we, we didn't hear much about the natural immunity um, of that kind of things, which I have because I had COVID. Anyway, um, so, but then one doctor did say, I, I listened to both sides. Really, COVID is not going away. And if it's not going away, we just need some strategies. We knew we, de we need to be unified with parents and teachers, administration, the board, to for our unified school district 305. We need to come together. I've been getting texts from mamas about the bathrooms, but they not only say, here's the problem, they have solutions and they're pretty good. But how do we get these solutions from here to here to here? Um, but I, I think we have some resources with some answers that we haven't tapped into yet. Because Salina is an amazing city. 
It is. And our school districts, this is what I'm declaring over there, and even Rodney Penn, he said it, and I'm going like, whoa, that's what I'm declaring too, that this school district is a strong school district. The levels academically are high. We are producing leaders, uh, productive citizens, and other people, schools, will come to USD 305 and say, what are you doing to cause this kind of an effect? I really, I really think that is going to happen. But we're, we are going to have to work together, find our resources. Um, like Lynn says, go into multiple, um, get the information out, you know. I and mean, this is the only time I get to talk to these guys. I know some of them, some of them I don't know, and they're wonderful people because they put their time in there and they don't get paid. So they are totally volunteers, and I just want to thank you. And I thank you, Lynn, and thank you, all the board members, and thank you, parents, for coming. Really, uh, I, I assume that when I first started coming in May, it wasn't much, nobody was coming. And so now we got people that care, and I think that's very important. I'm done. Thank you, Ms. Oh, oh I did have a, a grandbaby last night. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ms. <Mr. laughs> okay. Um, I got to attend the thank you note pieces. That was great. Um, I think that there was, there was many takeaways from that. One was watching all of the different age level kids come in and seeing a first grader come in and want to write a thank you note to their teacher and a sixth grader and thinking to my mind, thinking in my mind that all of the skill transition, the skill transfers, the growth that takes place in there. That was, that was huge for me to see that. But then the impact it had on the teachers. I, I try not to get on Facebook too much, but it was cool to get on there and see the, the teachers putting those thank you notes out that they, they really thought that that was impactful. So that was really cool. Um, I got to attend the Building Bridges event, uh, which was great. I don't I remember when, if that was between the last meeting and this meeting. Um, and last night I got to go to a vocal concert at South High. Um, they renamed it Gone with the Wind because it was rescheduled from the windstorm um, that we had. Um, but that also makes me want to put out a special thank you. Um, I was out of town that day. I, I left early that morning. We actually attended a chamber meeting, so I guess that's something I was at. And then I headed south. Um, but I had a few conversations throughout that next day with Deborah and with Lynn and hearing how the team came together and everything was pulled off, um, making sure that the structures were safe for students to be back in, working with other districts to arrange busing so that we could get students there. If we couldn't do that, finding ways to help families do those things. Um, you guys worked hard through that, you pulled together, and it was seamless to, to hear all the things going on in the background that most people have no clue about. Um, it's amazing to, to know those things happen, so thank you for doing that. <laughs> Next item we have is the superintendent's report with Superintendent Exxon. Uh Okay, clearly that needed a little bit of adjustment, so technology issues. I thank you for acknowledging the work on the windstorm. You know, any time I have to make a decision about a school closure, I take that very seriously. And I was in conversation with um, Deborah and I were here late the night that that was kind of all hitting and we had no power and we were in conversation via text message with Chris Upson to find out what was happening in the buildings. Principals were helping get information to us so that we could make the best decision for student safety. And I, I just, I, want, I know you know it, but I want the public to know that um, I believe kids need to be in school and I think that that's the safest place for them. But there are some times where I have to make the call as unpopular as it might be where we're not going to be in school. And um, the day when we were, the next day when we were working through the issues and trying to assess damage, I really appreciate the way our team came together on that. 
um, you know, we would make assignments and everybody would go to their own separate corners and get to work and then come back and report and you know it it really helped so the um i want to acknowledge several school districts that offered up buses and um jeff you can help me we didn't have to end up using any of them because durham was working behind the scenes trying to figure out what they were going to do as far as busing but um twin valley offered buses el saline offered buses southeast of saline offered buses um, Minneapolis did and so and we had arranged actually because we could get as many as we needed from southeast we'd arranged the pickup and everything so those districts were so gracious with us as Lisa was trying to work through insurance issues on how can we drive their buses so just a lot of moving parts there that I and I, you know you acknowledge that that I that it really does take a team to make those things happen. And I really appreciate our M&O team getting um, facilities safe for students to be back. So just to acknowledge that. I, I do want to tell you that right now we are struggling to fill substitute positions. And I mean really struggling. Our teachers, um, if you see a teacher, tell them thank you for what they do. Um, they're they're pitching in and covering classrooms for us. Um, administrators are doing the same at the building level. Um, instructional coaches. So there there's just a all, it's all hands on deck um, because of trying to make sure that students are getting instruction in classrooms. And um, so that you know we certainly can use more substitutes and we will train. Um, so just a plea that if there are people out there that would. Um, like to help us, that would be a great way to help us. I do um, also want you to know that today I went to the KASB Advocacy Network. That is a group um, that any of you can join that actually teaches you about um, the different legislative issues that are going through and, um, and how to make sure that we are telling our story and providing information that's helpful. To those, of the, to those people that are representing us. And so that was a really good experience today and I can get more, if anybody's interested in that, I can get more information um, to the board members on that. Finally, I wanna just say that um, Mrs. Rector's department, um, Mrs. Collins, that last night they started our project-based learning training. We have 35 teachers that are in, um, engaged in the pilot. That is part of the strategic plan. And with that project-based learning, what we're trying to do is figure out, is this company that is providing the training high enough quality for us to be able to use them uh, more widespread? But we were thrilled. We, I, Shanna, do you, how many applicants did we have for that? We had over 50 applicants. Okay, and so we have 35 people that are engaged in that training, and, and they did start last night. So the, the wheels are moving on that, and I'm really excited about what that can do for student engagement and student learning. Thank you, Superintendent Exxon. I think that's one of the things that, in the midst of, there's so many moving pieces to keep, to keep us going forward. It's not one issue. It's... It's a new issue every day sometimes. Um, so thank you for tackling that. The next item on our agenda is executive session. We do have two of those for personnel. How long do we need for the first one? The first one will need 10 minutes. 10 minutes. If someone would make a motion for that, please. Mr. President, I move the Board of Education go into executive session at 7.33 for 10 minutes for the purpose of discussing personnel matters of non-elected personnel and their contractual obligations because if this matter were discussed in open session, it might evade the privacy of those discussed. And that the Board of Education reconvene into open session at 7.43 in the SEC room. Mr. Grant, is it possible that we move that to 7.35 so we have some time for... Yeah, and 7.45. Are you okay with that? Okay. So we have a second. motion and a second. second. All in favor, please raise your right hand. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you.
Okay, so we are back in session. Is there a motion regarding our executive session? Mr. President, if I may, I move that the board accept the early resignation of Mr. Adam Lesser and that the board impose the liquidated damages. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Ms. Zimmerman, there's a motion and a second. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7 0. I believe we do need another executive session. How long do we need for this one, do you believe, Ms. Exley? 25 minutes. 35 minutes. If someone would like to make the motion. <laughs> Dr. Bandry. Move that the Board of Education go into executive session at 7.50 for 25 minutes, I'm gonna go with 25 minutes, to discuss the evaluation of non-elected personnel because if this matter were discussed in open session, it might evade the privacy of those discussed. And that the Board of Education reconvene at open session at 8.15 in the SEC room. We have a motion, is there a second? Mr. Grant. The motion and second, all in favor, please raise your right hand. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7 0. We will be in executive session.
All right, so we are back from executive session. I don't believe we have a motion on the executive session, but is there a motion? Move we adjourn. We have a motion. Second. All in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed, stay signed. We are adjourned.